Well, let me tell you a little about me. I quit the school very directly. I don't pull punches, but I'm a very nice man. But I preach the truth very directly. Because that's the only thing that can save. An opinion cannot save you. A traditional view cannot save you. Jesus Christ, whom you love, he said in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy customs. Sanctify them through thy tribal traditions. What did he say? Sanctify them how? Through thy truth. But what is truth, says Pilate? My word is truth. That's my mission. And I want you to know that very clearly. I want you to bring people with you. Because what you'll be hearing will be a great blessing to you. And you cannot afford to be stingy with divine blessings. Bring someone with you. Bring a friend. Bring an enemy. And let the word of God turn the enemy into a friend. Bring your children. Bring your spouses. Bring your ex-husbands. Ex-wives. Bring your boyfriends. Bring somebody else's wife. <laughs> but bring people to hear God's word. Are you with me? Amen. But there's somebody say amen. amen. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, seven o'clock. And we usually we are supposed to finish at seven thirty, but because it's Sunday night, I have been given some leeway to go beyond seven thirty. Not a long preacher usually, so please don't worry. Greetings, I bring you from Michigan Conference. As you heard, the very first conference organized in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, organized in 1860, and the General Conference was organized in 1863. So I bring you greetings from that very first conference, and from all the faithful people of God in that part of the world, where you've been my wife, uh, who is back home, holding the fort, while I am crisscrossing the globe, trying to save sinners into the kingdom of God. I... Uh, they are many Zimbabweans in the United States, and I bring you greetings from them. And uh, we will have a blessed time from tonight until December 1. We will meet every night. When I do these meetings, I take no nights off. Because no one has yet given me a good reason why I should take a night off from preaching the gospel. Because every night, there's someone who needs to hear the word of God. Am I right? Every night. I want you to make whatever sacrifice you need to come and listen to God's word. You will be blessed. Your children will be blessed. That's a promise. Not from me, but on the basis of God's word. Our subject for tonight, you're hanging an innocent man. Hanging an innocent man. Before I begin, do three things for me. Those of you who are outside, come on in, please, and find yourself a comfortable seat. Fear number one, I'd like you to turn all your cell phones off. Not down, off. I can't say off in short, but you understand. I want your phones turned off. It's a very dangerous thing to disobey a preacher while he's in a pulpit. Now, you disobey me if you run to me downtown in the market. But when I occupy the sacred desk, and I ask a favor, do everything in your power to grant me that favor. All phones off. Not down, off. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, I want you to pray for me. What I want you to say is, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. And this is based on Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9, which says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. My words will not help you. God's words will save you. Can you say amen? amen? All during the sermon, you say in your heart, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. And that is a very serious request. And fear number three, I want you to think as you listen. If people would think they would not do a lot of the things they do. If people would think, they wouldn't associate with the people they associate with. 
If people would think, they would not drink some of the things they drink. Are you with me? If people would think, they would not have the boyfriends they have. Now let me tell you something about me. I am quick to get into your business. That's my work as a preacher, to meddle in people's business. Did you hear me? So I will meddle. And I will meddle without hesitation, but I will meddle for your growth and your salvation. Can you say amen? And I will meddle as your brother in Christ. And I will meddle lovingly. And I will meddle without a spirit of condemnation, but I will meddle. I want you to think. Pray for me to love for selfishness. Are all forms turned off? Is anyone rebelling against that witness? This is serious. Okay. Let's bow our heads. We pray. Jump right into the message. Loving Father in heaven, you know I have one purpose in my mind, and that is to lift you up through the word, to lift the cross. Father in heaven, I am a sinner. I am dirt. I am earth. I am clay. And so I need divine help. And I'm asking you in the name of your Son and my Savior, Jesus Christ, put your words in my mouth. Fill me with your spirit as I humble myself in your presence. Touch the hearts of those who listen, dear God, that they may receive the word gladly. If they boast them on their way, bring them safely, Father. Bless us with an understanding of your will for us tonight. I offer this prayer from my heart. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say, Amen, amen. and amen. amen. Hanging the wrong man. Our overall theme is God has answers. I have a question for you. God has answers to all kinds of questions. Now, there are some questions we never ask. Because... When things are going well, people don't ask questions. For instance, if you're healthy, you don't hang your head and say, why am I healthy? If your children are doing well in school, if your marriage is strong, your family is strong, you don't say, why do I have a strong family? If you're employed, you don't say, why is it that I have a job? But if you're unemployed, why is it I'm jobless? Why can I get a job? Why did my wife leave me? Why is my eldest boy in prison? Why am I in and out of the hospital? Are you with me? Why do I live a life as if three or four witch doctors got together and each one put a curse on me? These are the questions we ask. Why is the church treating me so bad? Why was I rejected for that fever? Why am I sick? Why is it God seems not to hear me when I pray? Those are the questions we ask. And all those questions, they emerge from negative situations. And so the questions we want God to answer, the, the answers we want from God are answers to the questions that trouble us. But now I have a question for you. Why are we in circumstances that trouble us? Why are we sick? Why are family members in prison? Why are we divorced? Why are we unemployed? Why are we perpetually poor? Why are we unloved by many people? Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Our subject is hanging an innocent man. Genesis 1, how many of you have Bibles? Raise them, let me see. Raise them high, raise them high. All right, okay, this is not good enough. Bring your Bibles tomorrow. Can you say amen? amen? The Bible is the most important book you ever have. Always have it with you, bring it tomorrow night. Genesis chapter 1, read verse 31. The Bible says, And God saw everything that he had made. How many things did God see? Everything that he had made, and behold, finish the verse 40. It was very good. What was involved in everything? The physical world. The sun, the moon, the stars, 
the trees, the water, the dry land, the animals, light. Everything was well made, the Bible says. What else is included under all things or everything that he had made? God made marriage. That was very good. God instituted the Sabbath. That was very good. God instituted work. Genesis 2.15. That was very good. God instituted a particular diet. Plant-based. That was good. God said people should not be lonely. But the Bible says it is not good that man should be alone. It doesn't say it is not good that man should be single. It's okay to be single. It's not okay to be lonely. Are you listening to me? Jesus was single. Daniel was single. John the Baptist was single. Jeremiah was single. Adonai, Michelle, Azariah was single. It's okay to be single. It's not okay to be lonely. It's not okay to be isolated. So all these things the Bible says, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Nothing was wrong with what God had done. Nothing. Then what happened? Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. You read verses 16 and 17, our subject is hanging an innocent man. Genesis 2, 16 and 17, the Bible says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Look at verse 16 again, and there is one word that sticks out in my mind. Can you guess what that word is? One word. Look at verse 16. What's that one word do you think is sticking in my mind? Commanded. Listen to the words of God again. And the Lord God commanded. Is the same Hebrew word that you find for commandments right in the Old Testament? We are introduced to the concept of command. Now we're trying to identify why is it we have all these questions. And they all emerge from negative situations in our lives. We discover that God made everything very good. There were no problems. No one was poor. No one was broke. No one was divorced. We had none of these problems. Everything God made was good. Adam and Eve were close couple. They were healthy. They had food. They had everything. Animals did not eat people. People did not kill animals for food. Everything was fine. But something went wrong. And we're trying to identify what went wrong. Genesis 2.16, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now clearly, there was no death up to that point, because there would have been no need for God to use the future text. In the day thou eatest thereof, I want to substitute the word, the expression, in the day thou eatest, for something else. Now let me see if you're thinking. Listen to what God said. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. Then God says, For in the day thou eatest thereof, what is that? In the day that thou doest what? I think I heard the word. Disobey. Are you distracted by the good of people who just came in? So let me try again. I want you to be distracted by the gospel. Come on, say amen. amen. All I say by the gospel. Listen to God. You see, the Bible is an easy book to understand. Well, Daniel and Revelation have challenges, yes. But all you and I need to know to be saved is as simple and as plain on the noses of our faces. God said, don't eat of that tree. That's a command. And he said, if you disobey this command, what will happen? You will die. 
Now, I want you to observe something carefully. God never said, in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt be sick. But the sickness begin. Come on, answer. Do we get sick? Yes. yes. God never said, in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt divorce. But do we have divorce? Yes. yes. There's something I'm leading you to, and I hope you're thinking. God never said, in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt be jobless. But do we have joblessness? Yes. <laughs> Death of sickness. Family problems, joblessness, war, plagues, famine, natural disasters, as we saw in the United States on the eastern part of the country, already sandy, tribal conflicts, crime. All of these things are part of the human life. But all God said was, if the day thou eatest thereof, Thou shalt surely die. Now, think with me. If all these things came along, then all these things, in some way, are an expression of death. <laughs> now, the Hebrew expression, if the day thou shalt die, thou shalt die, means dying, thou shalt die. Meaning, you begin to die. You see, you can die immediately, or you can die slowly. Are you with me? All of the problems we face are expressions of death. Because God never intended them for us. Now, how are we hanging an innocent man? The United States was struck by Hurricane Sandy a week ago, devastated East Coast, more than 7 million without power at one point. They're going to find what is called a Norista, a small storm, caused more problems. It was four, I believe it was, December 26th, there was a tsunami that swept the Pacific Rim, the Indian Ocean, I should say. Almost 300 people died. In 2010, there was an earthquake in Haiti, about 300,000 people died. In 2011, there was a volcanic uh, an earthquake in Japan, and uh, hundreds of villages washed away, several thousand people dead, several thousand missing, multiple thousands of this. In Guatemala, two days ago, there was an earthquake, and several people were killed. Every year, the avalanches that destroy people. Volcanic eruptions that bury villages destroy people. All these things are referred to in the legal language, particularly in Western society, as acts of God. <coughs> Let me say that again. A hurricane is called an act of God. A flood is an act of God. And so mankind has associated God with disaster. And there are no acts of Satan. Have you ever heard of an act of Satan? There are none. If you run a business in the United States, I don't know about your laws in that, but since you're formerly British, and British is the basis of American law, British common law, Perhaps you will you, you understand what I'm about to say. Let's say you run, do uh, you have DHL in Zimbabwe? Okay. And you promise to deliver a package the next day by noon. And the person is in the middle of you're supposed to deliver it to Harai. But there is an earthquake, and all the roads are torn up. That person cannot sue you for not keeping your word. You can argue in court an act of God. God caused it. So you couldn't deliver the package on time. What I'm saying is, we associate God with disaster. We associate God with AIDS. When a baby dies, we blame God. When there's a war, we blame God. But let me say this again. Listen to what the Bible says. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. That's what God did. Are you with me? What God did was very good. God said to humanity, he said to the whole world, the population was just two, but that is still the whole world. Did I confuse you? The population of the world was two. That is still the population of the world. God told the whole world, do not eat of this tree. If you do, you will die. I'm 
And from this pronouncement of death includes sickness, suffering, disease, war, all expressions of death, you will die. And God told mankind, he told us. Because God never ambushes people. God always comes up front. What happened? Was it God who sinned? Or we sinned? We disobeyed God. And as a direct result of disobeying God, we suffer as we do today. I say again, we are hanging as an innocent person. And that innocent person is God. There are people who have left the church because of God. I grew up in the church, returned my tithe, my husband left me for another woman. Where was God? I raised my children in church school. Now my son is a drug addict. Where was God? I've been a faithful member. My house burned up. Where was God? And there are people who have left the church, broken their connection with God because they blame Him for every setback in their life. I say again, God's contribution was very good. Everything He had made was very good. Our contribution was sin. Somebody needs to apologize to God. Let me take a little step further to see how we have gotten ourselves into this. But I want you to know God has the answers. Who has prayed for me so far? Said, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Anyone? Any nice person? Not one nice person. Ah, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Who else can I say God bless you? Oh, God bless you. I see your sister, God bless you, if that's the truth. All right, God bless you over there. God bless you. Who else pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Sister in green, God bless you. Green to the color of folks, if that's green, I'm not blind. Uh, anyone else? All right, thank you for your prayers. Keep praying. Say, Father, put your words in that man's mouth. Now, let's get back to Matt. Sin. Listen carefully to me as you do the favor of the three which is sin. How many sins does the Bible say Adam committed? One. Is it your culture not to answer the guest? <laughs> no, tell me, so I'm not shocked and outraged. Is it your culture not to answer? No. Okay, when I ask you a question, answer me. Are you with me? How many sins does the Bible record Adam committed? One. What did God do? What did God do? Put him out. What does that tell you about what God requires of us? Perfection. Ah, all of you is. Is that this man who said perfection? Listen to me again. Adam committed one sin, and God put him out. Which means God does not tolerate one sin. Now, the many Christians who say, no, there's no such thing as perfection. How would God require perfection? God's standards has never changed. And will never change. Because his standard is based on his own righteousness. Are you with me? Adam committed one sin. Now, here's my other question. How many sins did Adam need to commit for Christ to come and die? One. One. Is everyone following me? One. Then, all the other sins committed over 6,000 years were absolutely unnecessary. And who committed them? We did. But whom do we blame? Let me say that again, and the concept may be new to you, or so you're dizzy. <laughs> Listen to me carefully. All that was required for Christ to come and die was one sin. It not only tells us God requires perfection, it tells us what a terrible thing one sin is, that someone equal with God would have to come and die. There's no such thing as a little sin.
Mankind kept sinning and sinning and sinning. Now, since God functions on the principle of proportion, behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man what? According. That's proportionality. Is that word too big? What does it mean? You said it's not big. What does it mean? If F I use the word, you don't understand. Raise your hand and say, Preacher, I don't understand that word. God is a God who does one thing in relation to another. Are you with me? So if you sin this much, yes, you're going to die. But you'll only suffer this much before you die. Some of you say, Why did I come tonight? I'm depressed. No, you just stay with me. God is a God of proportionality. You say this much, I punish you this much. Proportionality in your workplace. You work five days a week, eight hours a day, I give you this much money. That's proportionality. Are you with me? Now, the more you sin, the more you suffer. Are you following me? We kept sinning and sinning and sinning. When man sinned, listen to what God said in Genesis 3, 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is for thy sake. That's curse number one. Now it was God's desire not to curse the earth anymore. Listen to God speaking to Cain. Genesis chapter 4, verse uh, 12. Cain said, my, 12 or 13, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Now why is he saying that? Because God has said in verse 11, It shall not henceforth yield unto thee the strength. God is saying, Because of your murder of Abel, the earth will become even more difficult for you to cultivate. That was curse number two. Because of what? Sin by a human being. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, the Bible says, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled the sweet savour, and the Lord said in his heart, Genesis 8, 21, I will not again curse the ground or the earth for man's sake. Third curse. When Adam sinned, God cursed the ground. When Cain killed him or murdered him, God cursed the ground. Because of the sins of the pre and the Diluvians, God cursed the ground with the flood. The ground was cursed three times. Because mankind would not stop sinning. Let me say it again, my friends. All the sins that came after Adam's one sin were all unnecessary. Now I'm not saying Adam's first sin was necessary. Let me say that very clearly. But having committed that one sin, no other sin was necessary. Because adding more sins will make Christ come a little more quickly. We are responsible for our hardships and our problems as a general statement. But God has an answer. We just covered tonight. It's to five after seven. God made everything very good. No problems. Everything was perfect. We discovered God gave a command, do not eat of that tree. Then he gave the consequences. If you do, you'll die. If you disobey, you'll die. Now that sense of death included all the expressions of death, sickness, war, everything else that plagues our society. They are expressions of death. We kept sitting. And so God cursed the earth the second time when Cain murdered Abel. He cursed the earth after the flood. We just kept sinning and we keep sinning. And since God punishes us by proportion, the more you sin, the more you suffer. And it's not God's fault. Having caused all the problems, let's divide responsibility. God was responsible for all the blessings. We, by disobedience, we brought in all the problems, put ourselves in quicksand, and could not get ourselves out. And so the God whose command we disobeyed, he 
provided an answer to our crisis. And what was that answer? Give me one man's name. Christ. Now, Christ came to pay the penalty for our sins. And Christ is the answer to every question you have. Every question you have begins with Christ. The answer begins with Him and ends with Him. But you'll observe that I said, death pronounced by God included all the expressions of death, all the problems we have, which are the result of sin, are expressions of death. We are a dying society. Were it not for God's plan of salvation to redeem us, we would eventually become extinct. Are you following me? That's not. Jesus Christ, then, he had to come and reverse that. That's what he meant, and it's lonely, it needs help. All right. I say I'll have to pay for an event in this place. But I'll be humble, it's okay. Christ came to reverse what we did. What power does Christ use to do that? Because it's the same power you will use to answer your questions and to solve your problems. In Ephesians chapter 1, reading from verse 19, Paul says, there's some things he wants the church to know. And he wants them to know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Let me simplify verses 19 and 20 of Ephesians 1. Paul is saying, I want you to know the power that God uses in the lives of those who believe. It is the same power that was used to raise Christ from the dead. Amen. Let me say it differently. <clears throat> Whatever problem you have, it is not a series of death. Okay. The most irreversible problem a human being can have is death. Are you with me? We can reverse sickness. Am I right? Yes. You can lose your girlfriend and get her back. You can lose a husband and get him back. You can lose your job and get it back. You can lose your health and get it back. You cannot get back. You can get back your life once you lose it. What am I saying? You can get back. It is irreversible from our standpoint. Christ came with a power that can reverse our worst problem. What's that problem? Death. Amen. Now, when you go to the hospital, there's someone sick, you pray, and you know there's some hope. The modern medication and the modern medical technologies, there's some hope. When you're unemployed, there is some hope. You can get a job or start your business. When you stand at the grave of a loved one, you are not expecting that one to get up right to your presence. Yes, in the resurrection, yes, not now. And so there's a feeling of absolute helplessness. You can be the president of the world. When you stand before death, you are helpless. And so Christ came with a power that begins at that helplessness. It is a power that reverses death. As says, death has many expressions. Sickness, poverty, whatever else, family problems. That power that conquers death with being our biggest problem, can conquer every other problem we have. Amen. Are you with me? Because the power God uses in our lives is a power that reverses death. And if he has the power to reverse death, he has the power to reverse joblessness, because reversing joblessness is easy. Amen. Let me ask you this. What problem do you have that God can fix? Which he didn't cause. <coughs> I said which he didn't cause. Come on, someone say amen for God. Amen. There is no problem. There is no question you have for which God does not have a satisfactory answer. But my brothers and sisters, you and I must confess we have been hanging the wrong man. Amen. Who should we be hanging? We owe God an apology. And I say that very seriously. 
blaming God for all our misfortunes. We have all misfortunes as a result of sin. If there had never been sin, there would never have been death. Sickness, poverty, <coughs> war, plague, hurricanes, famine, nothing. Just blessings and happiness. Who ruined that? We did. Tonight, I want us to take God off the gallows. We've been hanging him for 6,000 years. And yet we say God is good all the time. Some of us need to re-examine our relationship with God. Some of us have a hostile relationship with God. I am mean hostile. We go to church, we pray, we sing, but we have in our hearts a hostile relationship with God. Because we hold him responsible for the setbacks in our lives. But tonight, I want to present to you an innocent God. A sinless God. A righteous God. Who has never done anything wrong. And God is so tired of being falsely accused. He appeals to the Israelites in Micah chapter 6 verse 3. And he says, oh my people, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against thee. God says, let's go to court and build your case against me. See how far you get. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 5, God cries out again, Thus saith the Lord, what iniquity have your fathers found in me? Let me put it in a modern way. What wrong thing has God done to you? Not one thing. Tomorrow night, Unless the Spirit changes my mind. I will discuss a God of love. Tonight I want to present to you a God of innocence. In no way responsible for our problems. But has taken the burden on himself to provide a solution, to provide the answers. And as you come night by night, the word of God will provide the answers. But let me say something tonight. Let me see how you respond now to the very message. God is good, all the time. and all the time, God is good. yes he is, and I say it from my heart, God has never done me anything wrong. Every blessing I have had has come from God. Every setback, every problem, every difficulty, every hardship, I claim sole responsibility. And so for me, I publicly say that God has never done me anything wrong. But I have done him so much wrong. And so I again apologize to God. For the many times I have falsely accused him and treated him badly. I am sorry. And I thank him for his mercy in keeping me alive. Using me to preach his word. But tonight, I want you to make a commitment in your heart. That's favor number two, favor number one. If you have had a hostile view of God, you've been angry with God, and some people are angry with God. You may have come angry. And having heard the message, you want to say, Father, I have had the wrong attitude towards you. I am sorry. Father, I say, I have had the wrong attitude towards you. I have accused you falsely for my problems, and I am sorry. Is there someone who wants to say that to God? Don't be, God bless you. Don't be afraid. I won't call you up. Don't be afraid. God bless you. I mean that from my heart. God bless you. God bless you. Wrong attitude towards God. You may take your hands down, and you and I want to say, I am sorry. And I want to be a man and take responsibility for my problems and acknowledge that God. He's a good God, a God of blessings, a God of love, and you will find that out tomorrow night. If the, I lost the Holy Ghost changes my mind, bring people to listen to tomorrow night's message. I'll be talking about the God of love. And I'll tell you something, if it doesn't soften your heart, nothing will. My second call tonight, how many of you will say, Father, I recommit my life to you. 
with the consciousness that all you desire for me is a blessed life. Can I see your right hand? I recommit my life to you tonight with the consciousness that all you desire for me is a blessed life. If you raise your hand seriously, stand with me. Yes, Bob, I suppose. Loving Father in heaven, thank you, dear God, for your long suffering nature. Thank you, Father, for your patience and for the almost impossible ability you have to love those who hate you, to love those who curse you, to love those who falsely accuse you. And you have been suffering that for 6,000 years. Years. I don't understand it all how you do. But tonight, Father, your word has touched our hearts. We have been convicted. We have been hanging the wrong person. Now, Father, we want to take off the gallows from our hearts and put you on the throne of our lives. Asking you, dear God, direct us. Answer our questions as we humbly put them to you. Solve our problems as we humbly acknowledge responsibility for bringing them on us. Please, Father, forgive us for the hostile attitude we've had towards you. And in your boundless love, wrap your arms around us. Reassure us of your undying love as expressed in the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. Now grant us your spirit. That we may leave this place with a different view of you and more closely connected to your heart. Take us home safely, Father. Send your angels to escort our homes. Watch over us as we sleep, and if in your wide reaching mercy you give us life tomorrow morning, let us come to this place at nine o'clock. And if you extend that life to the evening, let us be here at five or five thirty in the morning. Father, we deserve nothing from you, but you are willing to give us everything in the person of Christ. Thank you for that. Bless every visitor, every member. Bring us tomorrow, I pray, from my heart. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Let all the lost people say, Amen. 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 God bless you. This may sound strange, but I love you. Come back tomorrow so we can listen to God's word.